I have come to eradicate religion as it is the bane of man, warped in superstition, ignorance and fear. The emperor before the treason of Horus. Conquering the galaxy is one thing, but he was so powerful he never once stopped looking fabulous while doing it. At least until the whole Horus thing, anyway. Wars begin when you will, but they do not end when you please. Niccolo Machiavelli, the emperor loves no one man. He cannot afford affection that is the honest practical for the impossible task that faces the master of mankind. He did not love his sons. He does not love men, but he does love mankind. Rob out Gilliman. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Isaiah well, the emperor is just this guy, you know, gag Halfrant. All hail the god emperor of mankind. The god emperor of mankind, also known as the emperor, emps, big daddy emps the motherfucking emperor, big e, e money, augustus imperator, deus imperator, primogenitor, the outlander, him on earth, all father, master of mankind, the immortal emperor, the golden king, the omniscient, the cartomancer, the impenator, the fresh emperor of sacred terror, that guy with the bigger gun than you space Jesus, the man emperor of mankind, lord of bling, my manly man para, lord sovereign of the imperium, the king of terror or if you are of different inclinations, called the anathema, the carrion lord, the false emperor, the corpse emperor, that twat with the chair, that loony shaman chassis, space lenin, giant crunchy psychic sandwich, or the corpse on the throne is the almost but not entirely figurehead ruler of the imperium of man in the warhammer 40k universe. He has been enthroned on or rather in a life sustaining device known as the golden throne for the last 10 millennia and is nigh on unable to communicate or influence things directly. So day to day ruling is done without and too often despite him. But on the other hand he is the only sustaining hope for humanity as faith in him is the only fluff wise way humans can counter the insidious whispers of ruin and the treacherous ways of the Xenos. Besides that, faster than light travel is entirely dependent on him. The administratum he ordered to be established continues to govern the imperium in his name. But it is generally accepted that the absence of the emperor's proper guidance is what has turned the imperium into the hellish mess that it is. In the Imperium, questioning whatever your superior yells at you, is treason and heresy, typically punished by euthanasia at least in the material realm. He created the 20 Primarchs, who viewed him as their father. However, he saw them more as tools, and instead of names, referred to them by numbers. It goes without saying that would the Emperor be up and about in the 41st millennium he would be very disappointed. Most fat guys expect him to speak in a generic deep, stentorian voice. Though men also would expect him to speak more like another immortal who wishes to guide humanity to the path of ascension, who may as well be one of his past guises. Clearly the cult of the extragalactic alien self-replicating space rock thing didn't work out in the end so he had to try another approach. It would explain why he's so fond of impractically large tanks, walkers, mecha, incredibly unaerodynamic VTOLs and bling though. The entire history of the emperor. Biggie gets all the bitches. The Emperor is heavily implied to be conformed by GW a perpetual, an immortal sicker with countless lifetimes worth of knowledge and power and the ambition to use it. According to the fluff, the being that would eventually become known as the Emperor was born in 8000 BC in Anatolia modern day Turkey on the banks of the Sakaya river to a tribe of proto-Hittites. Possibly in Gubakli Tepe. From his own account, his path towards greatness was spurred on when his uncle murdered his father. So Kid Emps did the responsible thing and gave his uncle a myocardial infarction, or as it's known on the street, a fucking heart attack. Kid Emps then realized that humans needed laws, and good laws needed to be given by good leaders which he defined to refer to himself specifically, setting him on the xenogenocidal path of self-righteousness and conquest that would continue for the next 38,000 years. Considering that the Imperium's two-headed symbol was used by Hittites, Games Workshop, for all its flaws and pricing policies can be given credit for doing his history homework. According to 1st 2nd edition fluff, his birth was the result of hundreds of human shamans committing ritual suicide to be reborn as a single individual capable of protecting humanity from the chaos gods. However, the validity of this fluff is frequently questioned, given it hasn't been official since 2nd edition. However, this theory seems unlikely, especially given that other perpetuals are known to exist, some of which may be even older than the emperor, and they don't have godlike powers. On the other hand, 
They also wouldn't have had the memories and soul stuff of all those shamans telling them what to do. This theory would go a long way to explaining the seemingly contradictory behaviors of the Emperor. All those shamans have disagreements and Big E has to listen to it all. The Chaos Gods apparently view the Emperor as an equal rival due to his acquisition of powers at a later point see below and name him Anathema. Yet other fluff tidbits imply that he is some sort of flesh construct from the Dark Age of Technology run amok and aping human affectation. Lore also mentions that he guided humanity throughout history under a number of guises, and many of the probable identities of the Emperor in world history may include but are not limited to Hammurabi the first man to invent the concept of written law, Alexander the Great the most fabulous conqueror in all of history, with the philosopher Aristotle as his teacher, Julius Caesar guess why the Imperium spoke Latin, Jesus's demonstration of his supernatural godlike status and abilities and that he will sacrifice himself for the progress of humanity. Which is a symbolic idea, as pre can the law lean towards the Emperor being one of Jesus' disciples, Napoleon Bonaparte to dismantle the old stagnating monarchies of Europe and replace them with revolutionary ideals, and Abraham Lincoln to bitch slap some racist Slavialnas into knowing that blacks are humans too and, it has to be assumed, Conan the Barbarian yup, he used to be an asshole, a handsome, muscle-bound asshole, at least before he got wiser and he man, sometime around the 11th or 12th century. He battled a shard of the Void Dragon in modern day Libya. He eventually defeated it and locked it on Mars, allowing the Adeptus Mechanicus to control machines, eventually. Of course, it's not entirely clear whether this is true or not. It's entirely possible that all of the Emperor's history is a lazily crafted lie he throws around because no one can debunk it. Although given how awesome it sounds, we're going to say it is. Either that or it's just another example of how G-dubs can't be bothered to keep their stories consistent even about the most important parts of the setting. Just remember to take stuff with a grain of salt, since, you know, whatever his actual origins might have been. For the most part he more or less stayed out of the way of humanity's progress during the next 30,000 years of history. Including the dark age of technology, though hot off the press fluff indicates he might have been traversing outer space in old style NASA rockets with the other perpetuals, to eventually coming to find the planet Molech, where he passed through a gateway that led directly to the fortresses of the four chaos gods. Here, he either challenged, bargained, or stole portions of power from a source claimed by the gods as their own. This would earn him the ire of the duped defeated ruinous powers, who consider him as some sort of usurper or that he reneged on some kind of undisclosed deal we haven't been made aware of yet. He returned to Terra at the closing years of the Age of Strife. With Terra cut off from the rest of the human empire and Terra itself ruled by warring techno-barbarians, in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, E-Money decided to reveal himself, using his mastery of genetic engineering to create the custodians and cheaper, easier to make thunder warriors the predecessors of the space marines. Using join me or die tactics, he managed to conquer the entirety of Terra during the event called Unification Wars. Then, he made contact with Luna and the Mechanicum of Mars. When dealing with Mars, he called himself the Omniscient and convinced them to build him weapons and spaceships. Around this time, he also created a doctrine, the Imperial Truth, which states that religion, faith, and superstition must be all banned because they have never succeeded in unifying the human race during all of Emp's lifetime. Simply put, the whole piece, love, and religion, mumbo jumbo has never worked and now must be eradicated ignoring or forgetting what happened to real life societies that tried to throw faith and religion under the bus without molding the society towards abandoning religion willingly. Exception where he's not a perfect badass, the last church. It is permissible to substitute the voice of whatever angry militant atheist appeals to you most least for the duration of this one short story. Also, according to that same story, this asshole wiped out Scandinavia, right when Scandinavia was getting fun again. According to the Horus Heresy books that mention the Unification Wars, he burned down a lot of things on a partially recovering terror. But, before he set out to conquer the stars with the newly formed Imperial Army which contained both ground forces and space-borne fleets, he decided to create the 20 Primarchs, using himself as the genetic template, while splitting the additional power he acquired from the Chaos Gods into 20 portions, 
infusing each piece with a fragment of his own personality, to allow them, in turn, to congeal and gestate just like how demons are born into the indomitable souls of his future primarchs. Then, he bound each such vessel soul to their godlike body shells as they formed in their gestation capsules. Let this sink in each primarch is basically a unique quasi-demonic soul, bound to a super awesomely tough material body, though with this power apparently stolen, the big four will inevitably and continually be pissed at him for using their power for his own ends. So the chaos god snatched the primarchs away via time travel as a vision shenanigans. Don't even try to explain it here. Just read the first heretic, inside their incubator pods and all, from the secret lab underneath the Himalayas, to scatter them away across the galaxy. Luckily for the emperor, some genetic samples were left over from each primarch, so from that he created 20 legions to serve as the elites of his army the space marines. So, with his armies and spaceships complete minus the primarchs, which he hoped to find, he embarked upon the Great Crusade, to restore mankind to its rightful place as rulers of the galaxy. However, the Emperor himself states to Arklan Land the guy who discovered Land's speeders raiders that he never considered the Primarchs to be his little sons and saw them as well crafted tools so he could get his work done. Likening himself to Geppetto from Pinocchio in that it is only natural for 20 wooden boys to think of their creator as father. Whether he felt any kinship between all of them or only some of them is not entirely known. But it seems like he was all like, you all think I'm a bad dad, but look, shit I just made these kids in a lab. I'm not really their dad. Then again he put some personas for every occasion during the meeting. Lance saw him as not as a gold armored god, but as an utterly logical scientist and the emperor had the whole shtick of people interpreting his words in the manner that made the most sense to them personally who really knows when he is being genuine or not or how he feels. On that note, Aaron Dembski Bowden has insisted that nothing the Emperor says in Master of Mankind should be taken at face value. Moreover, the Emperor is inconsistent in how he describes the Primarchs. While he uses numbers and it when talking to Ra and Land, at the end of a book he's referring to Horus by name and as a he, not in it. ADB has doggedly refused to clarify, because he enjoys watching the arguments he's kicked off. However, in Laurie Golding's audiobook Malkada First Lord of the Imperio, Malkada pretty much spells out exactly the same thing, saying that the Primarchs were designed to be conquerors tools and nothing more, and had been manipulated into conflict with each other from the very start so that they would eventually destroy each other and pave the way for a human civilization, rather than a transhuman one and that the Horus heresy was always part of the plan. He does later have a minor breakdown and admit that he was forced to lie though, but is not clear on what elements. As a result, it is entirely possible and in fact more likely that there was no such plan to have the Primarchs destroy each other and that Malkada was merely trying to hide the fact that things had gone off the rails. Boohoo it and the board is set short story by Gav Thor. It seemingly reconfirms Malkada's admission as that the biggie and his bestie play a game of cards with each Primarch represented heavily implied in such a game. Mal plays as the game's war master while Spiggy plays the played the position of the emperor. The two seamlessly play out the entire events of the Horus heresy and even hypothetical scenarios had they played each Primarch differently against the others. And this, so they admit, is a game they have played endlessly throughout the Great Crusade, knowing full well what was to happen with exception to the end game. So, as of right now, the law leans towards the Emps and Mal being responsible, at least in part for the current state of everything by stirring each demigod into patricidal and genocidal rage and losing complete control of it all right when it mattered most. Good job, as he found each Primarch, he assigned them command of their respective legions and to act as his generals, warlords and pantheon of heroes that humanity were meant to emulate, in the quest to unify humanity in the Great Crusade although, at some point, one of them may have been executed and the other disappeared, leaving only 18 Primarchs and Legions after 100 years of the Great Crusade, a military campaign of a grand scale. This is also when the Spiss Marines were most awesome and at their peak. Just when things seemed to be going well, the Horus Heresy took place, where 8.5 of the Primarchs and their respective Legions rebel against the Emperor. In the end, the Emperor fought and slew Horus who was daddy's favorite but at a great cost. The Emperor was mortally wounded to the point that he had to be put permanently on a life support system known as the golden throne on that day an untold amount of manly tears were shed subsequently 10,000 years later without the emperor's leadership the imperium eventually degraded into the theocratic grimdark empire we all know and love today in the 41st millennium in the 500th year of the 41st millennium the exact middle of the millennium which is a few centuries before the time of ending began visions and signs reach out to all walks of life and social status to the imperium of the emperor crying 
whether it's to lowly denizens of an underhive having dreams about it, to respected sanctioned sickers reading it from the imperial tarot, to shamans on feral planets instinctively knowing that the extra rain pouring down lately are tears of sadness from their sky god. While interred on the golden throne, the emperor's psychic essence prevents demon kind from directly assailing terror through the broken remains of the imperial webway in the form of a golden sun, while additionally sustaining and managing the psychic beacon known as the Astronomicon, that makes warp travel within 50,000 light years around terror possible. A question that remained unanswered for a long time is that, is the above thing the only thing he is capable of doing these days? Or can he communicate with others? The recent advance in the timeline revealed that the newly revived Gilliman had an audience with him for a whole day, so presumably he can. Yes, he can. But then, what is he waiting for before waking the sleepy beauty up? It could be that he literally couldn't talk to anyone before that, considering that even Gilliman shuddered at the thought of the mental sandblasting that was speaking with the Emperor. It's possible the same communion might destroy a mortal, or kill the comatose lion by accident. Perhaps the only thing stopping the Emperor from direct governance of the Imperium is his psychic voice delivering the equivalent of an ordinatus blast every time he uses it, so he cannot chastise the incompetence of the higher lords for fear of killing them outright. It is common knowledge that the Emperor is the most powerful sicker alive, humbling even the Elder. It is also suggested that he has guided humanity in a guise of people like Julius Caesar, Conan the Barbarian, Chuck Norris, Christopher Lee, Tommy Wiseau and Jesus. It is uncertain as to whether or not his internment on the Golden Throne is a good thing. Some believe that if he were to die, the Imperium will truly fall into darkness, whereas others believe that if allowed to finally die, he would reincarnate and return to unify the galaxy once more, stronger than ever. Whatever the truth, Games Workshop are probably never going to advance the story, so speculation has little worth, unless you take Warhammer Fantasy as an example, where the timeline ended, badly. In which case prepare for a new galaxy populated only by Ultramarine and Corn Berserker clones. Or god forbid, Dark Elder going lonely, brooding goths and aiding the children of the people they just tortured to death because order something something slanesh's stomach something. As the golden throne is breaking apart, the Mechanicus and certain elements at the top of the Imperium tries to contact the Dark Elder for knowledge on how to repair the thing. The Carrion Throne reveals that a homunculus did make it to Terra. He is hunted down by the Inquisitor and the Custodes. The cheeky Psycho Doctor had absolutely no intention of repairing the thing but wanted to instead marvel upon the largest and greatest psychic pain machine ever constructed that made even a homunculus stand in utter awe. And look the cadaver buried within right in the eye sockets before both it and the machine ultimately died. When Rob Out was revived from stasis and finally got to Terra, he went into the throne room to have a chat with Biggie during their chat. Rob Out noted the Emperor regarded him with the interest one would regard at all. This leads Gilliman to believe that the ages of sitting on a gold throne had stripped away any vestige of humanity. The Emperor himself, a typical father and son chat between MP and Horus. The Emperor was a brilliant scientist, a powerful warrior, and great sicker, but he was a terrible father. Rob out Gilliman, giving a short, yet accurate biography of the Emperor. Though on the other hand, he would learn that the Emperor never saw himself as their father. Interestingly, no leader or warlord heresy. After he shaved his goatee, his chin radiated a brilliant light through the wall. The Imperial Navy uses this light as a beacon to guide them through that beautifully terrible place. He is sometimes referred to as the Emperor, a joke derived from the voice acting in the Dawn of War game, Soulstorm, specifically in Vic Borerell's final speeches. The Emperor is said to be so powerful that he could destroy suns with ease, though he has never actually done so he however, made a golden sun which he put in the middle of his broken webway gate to prevent demons from spilling through, albeit needing to concentrate on powering it for the next 10,000 years. This would indicate that the Emperor does indeed have the power to destroy stars. The Chaos Gods are scared as fuck of the guy, calling him respectively the Anathema, as in the polar opposites to Chaos. The Elder fear that if the Emperor were to die, a new Eye of Terror would pop out with Terror at its center and possibly a new Chaos God would be born. He was also capable of summoning what can only be called an army of human souls including every soldier who had died for him. Ferris Manus included to fight for him. An ability utterly unseen in the 40k universe and suggesting that he has some fundamental connection to human souls in the afterlife. A comforting thought compared to dissolving into the warp to be eaten by demons and giving some credence to the 40k era theory that when the time of ending, 
ends, the Emperor and all loyal human souls will join in one final battle against Chaos. After he was nearly killed by his son, he was placed upon the Golden Throne and hasn't moved for the past 10 millennia. Most of the fluff maintains that his existence on a day-to-day -day basis since then is a living hell by comparison. The torture astropaths go through when becoming one would be like a trip to the dentist. It's the mother father uncle second cousin of all mint fucks. So bad that even an inquisitor would likely go insane as a result or anybody else for that matter and yet he carries on. Why? He may be the universe's most powerful vegetable, but that doesn't mean that he will just take a sit and die. Oh no, it's exactly the opposite. It gives him a fuck ton of work to do. And along with being the lighthouse in the war, guiding the imperial navy, he also needs to make the aforementioned astropaths. As well as keeping all the nasties of the warp where they're supposed to be that is not invading real space to make the lives of all living things miserable. He also does it for the good of humanity sounds kinda familiar, doesn't it? In the last year of M41, tech priests discovered that the golden throne is failing and the emperor is dying. There is a chance of the emperor returning to life, as well as the risk that he will die forever. If the latter would be the case, then everyone in the galaxy will become a chaos sex toy punching bag plague vector science experiment. Note that if the emperor recovers, he'd be several hundred times more powerful. Emps was born of a group of sickers combining their might and souls in one ritual act. Maybe. Since then, MP has gained all human souls since he got put on that throne sea leveling in Dark Souls, as he is the afterlife now. Provided one excludes the veritable hell that is the warp, and all that stuff the elder get up to, in the grim darkness of the past 10 millennia, MP had a nice buffet. He's been up to all sorts of things. Our beloved father, consorting with Xenos, resurrecting ancient technology. Don't believe that he is blameless in this. Magnus the Red, his desire to guide and protect humanity, in addition to his power, made the Emperor as close to a farseer as humanity was ever going to get. He declared humanity to be superior to all Xenos which was fair enough considering the collapse of the Elder, planned to destroy every shard of religion by force of arms if needed in order to protect them from the whispers of chaos though he got the whole thing backwards. Since said religions were starving the chaos gods then again, he got it right after enthronement. Planned to reunite humanity under his rule no matter what anyone else wanted thought of that again by force of arms if needed. Cared little for the Primarchs being his actual sons thinking of them as generals and tools rather than biological offspring. And screwing over several of them in his efforts to recruit them making them follow orders. Hence causing some of their later betrayals. Carried out many unorthodox, morally questionable experiments and much much more. All because this was the only way he could foresee humanity surviving the threats to come. Also known as the Golden Path. Any other action he ever partook in, no matter how unorthodox or morally questionable or just outright horrific was secondary to the one and only goal survival. For a being that's lived millennia having foreseen as much as is possible to do so whilst not being an actual god, his way was the only way lest we all face extinction. Those were the options with the context of the universe he found himself in. Time was against him, and expediency was the order of the day. Secure the physical safety of mankind in the galaxy then safeguard their minds and souls. Everything else was a tool to be utilized in pursuit of that single purpose. It didn't matter how the godlike princelings felt, or how they were raised. It only mattered that they performed their allocated tasks as swiftly and efficiently as possible so that he could move on to the next phase of his great work. His reign eventually killed more humans not even counting those who were innocent than the entire total of all of humanity's dictators in history ironically that may have been past personas of the emperor. Even during the unification wars, several Terran cultures were wiped out completely Oriok on Antarctica, for example, was raised to the ground for being religious, just to make a point. Even after its forces were defeated and its people ready to surrender, while simultaneously being pretty terrible at incorporating non-Terran elements. Because that is just how damn important and dire the circumstances were. An entire galaxy spanning empire needed to be constructed in little under two centuries when the cataclysm was foreseen to occur and ain't no one got time to fart out about with treating people the way they deserve if the species won't survive. Contrary to popular belief, he really did think the post alana phase through to some degree. Horus was the right choice as war master for no other could command the respect of nearly all his brothers better than Luperkel the first, 
and Dawn as Praetorian was as correct a decision as was possible to make considering that his talents were put to good use throughout the heresy that followed. There was no need to put a Primarch in charge of the Council of Terror for the Primarchs were not made to rule, but to serve as generals in retaking the galaxy. Humanity was to be governed by humanity. Primarchs like say, Gilliman though perfect as an administrator, was better suited and needed as a general for the Great Crusade. Honestly, it's bewildering that no one in the military saw the need for human administration. Having godlike Primarchs in charge at the top only serves to increase superstition in a secular galaxy when the idea was to rid humanity of religion and superstition in order to better protect it from warp predation. To be fair, the whole reason humanity and the Emperor hate aliens is because during the Age of Strife numerous Xenos races exploited humanity's trust and either raided, lollygagged, looted or all of the above and were generally a nuisance the entire time. Then the Emperor comes along and decides that the best way to stop all that from happening again is to wipe out all Xenos that might even think to pose a threat to the fledgling Imperium. However, those few Xenos species that did not pose an immediate threat to humanity were usually made protectorate similar to the TAU government unless they resisted were in the way, possessed a planet, influenced human culture at all, or were intelligent at all, in which case the results were predictable. Ever since his ascension, the Imperium forgot about the part where harmless aliens could be tolerated. But on the other hand, the most common Xenos are massive dicks and aren't exactly willing to buddy up with the Imperium themselves. Plus, at least according to Horus Rising, the idea of letting Xenos exist and then eventually grow stronger is wrong on every level to the Imperium hence the whole mess with the Interex Diasporex. To be even more fair and meter, the triumvirate of Horus Heresy authors tend to have their own interpretation of the Big E. Graham McNeil generally portrays him as competent and benevolent if flawed. Dan Abnett portrays him as competent but bloodthirsty, while Aaron Dembski Bowden portrays him as a vicious, needlessly cruel imbecile and even this is counterbalanced by his portrayal in Master of Mankind, where he's interestingly a mixture of all the previous portrayals at once, which is kind of appropriate really. Chris Wright, as far as he has portrayed him, has done so through the eyes of Jagate Khan, showing him as deeply flawed and distant from his own sons, but also countering that he was working towards goals even the Primarchs couldn't fully grasp, even in Path of Heaven, where the Khan gets close to learning the secrets of the Webway project. He's shown to not have all the cards the Emperor's knowledge that humanity is evolving into a psychic race, for example. On another note, long before the Horus Heresy novel series, there were hidden gems noobs are not aware of, such as a text describing the fight between Horus and the Emperor although it wasn't written especially well, or conspiracy theories. One of them was actually the possibility that the Emperor was already dead when Rogaldorn managed to reach him. However, in the aforementioned text, Horus had realized that he had been wronged and deceived by the Chaos Gods, who immediately ceased to possess the War Master and fled before the Emperor's final force attack bring woe to both of them. What if the Emperor had spared him or if the War Master survived somehow? In Olden Fluff, all Primarchs were Sikas and originally supposed to be shining examplars of human free from the taint of the Empyrean which they failed to bear true potential due to their early contact with the warp, via the dark gods abducting them pedoba style. This in turn was what caused their mutations and unique characteristics and diversity which was more of a metaphor that each Primarch was an image of humanity themselves. In fact, much of the powers of the Primarchs, like the Emperor, would have come from their psychic abilities. It is known that Sensei's powers include health, regeneration, greater athletic prowess and overpowering their strength stat when they try to attack something. Thus it would not be surprising if it was also the case for Primarch's baby Sanguinius was super healthy and immune to Bale's radiations. Kurz crawled out of his molten drop pod and crater while screaming in pain and fled immediately, instinctively, into the darkness. And later his body was fully healed prior to the new fluff messing everything up. Cause BL writers have trouble getting their shit together. But back to where we are. The notion that the Emperor is dead forebodes a terrible possibility. In which the corpse that Rogaldorn took back on Terra's Imperial Palace was not Biggie but of Horus being passed as the Emperor. And was worshipped as such for 10,000 years. While this has become highly unlikely. It would both be a great and grim dark plot twist and an immense source of lulls. Especially when you mix in the events of Gathering Storm 3 with Rob out Gilliman. While this would explain why some fluff versions mentioned that no one save for the Adeptus Custodes companions have entered the throne room. And keep maximum security all the time to be fair. Other sources mentioned exceptions everywhere. 
such as the Sickers being needed in a sacrifice for the Golden Throne. Grey Knight's companies granted audience or certain high-ranked inquisitors such as their High Lord and Hector Rex. This theory has since been disproven. The truth is outright revealed in Dark Imperium, the first novel set after the Gathering Storm. Rob out Gilliman reflects upon his meeting with the Emperor saying that he entered the throne room expecting to find the emperor dead. The emperor was a wizened corpse surrounded by banks of groaning machinery, but the emperor was still alive and talked to him. Gilliman feels that the emperor's psychic might has grown since his death, but that his humanity has gone as well, to the point that Gilliman thinks that even if he is a god he doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Nonetheless, in some impossible fashion, something of the emperor has survived to M42. His short CV, aka how I got my god who, 8000 BC, M30k played different important people in human history, always manipulating from behind the scenes. M30k created custodes and thunder warriors to take over the earth, and the unification wars are fought. M30k made primarchs and space marines. Thunder warriors are wiped out. C. 798 M30K004 M31K The Great Crusade. C. 005014M31K Horus Heresy. 014M31K. Now the Emperor is entombed on the Golden Throne, powers the Astronomicon to make space travel possible at all and keeps demons from invading terror but cannot communicate with his subjects any longer except in extremely exceptional circumstances. Eats sickers like candy to stay the tiny bit alive he is. His goals and flaws led and shape mankind into a psychic race and surpass the elder by learning from their mistakes. Unite humanity under one aegis and allow for instant communication and travel across all human inhabited worlds, thereby uniting the species in a way that it had never been before. Most importantly, prevent another calamity like the age of strife or fall of the elder. In order to achieve this he had to shelter and protect humanity from the fell hand of chaos, reclaim every single human inhabited world, spacecraft or station, purge, at least sterilize all humans that had deviated from the normal strain of humanity because they would not evolve into the predicted psychic species and threatened the plan with their deviancy. Remove alien influence or control from human worlds. Eliminate external Xenos threats throughout the galaxy that might challenge or become a threat to mankind's supremacy. To achieve those secondary goals he had to create superhuman generals to bestride the galaxy and led men to innumerable victories. Create superhuman soldiers powerful enough to retake the galaxy beneath the banners of said generals from any enemy. Remove the influence of religion from the collective psyche of the human species in order to protect them from the insidious whispers of chaos often mistaken for something supernatural and hence a gateway to disaster. So in the pursuit of those tertiary goals, the emperor undertook the great crusade. Once it was over, all the primarchs were to have their place. Lorga was to be the emperor's herald and shelter mankind from superstition through enlightenment so that if ever they heard whispers in the dark, they knew it was not natural and to be feared by it, thus denying its embrace. Magnus was to assist the emperor in sitting on the golden throne of earth, thus powering the human webway shield somehow, becoming a key figure in humanity's ascension. Horus was to protect mankind from external physical threats throughout the galaxy as humanity's general. Conrad was to be the enforcer of the emperor's laws. Mortarian. His watch good of wayward deviancy etc. But the Imperium was only one half of the plan. The other was the webway, allowing nigh instantaneous travel and communication. Limiting mankind's reliance on the warp to almost nothing in the form of warp travel and thus protecting them against the influence of chaos. Therefore allowing mankind to evolve in relative safety and security under the direct guidance and control of the Emperor. When mankind would be ready, we'd be protected from the warp naturally. That was the final crowning achievement that would bring all the Emperor's plans to fruition and pull all the wayward goals into one singular perfect great work. All the sacrifice, all the death, all the heartache, the glory, the battles, the trials and tribulation. 48,000 years of history was culminating into that one plan, and it all would have been worth it because mankind would have been saved for all time, worth any price, where the ends justified the means, or so he claimed. And yet at the same time, it was this very same pragmatism that ultimately led to his downfall. Though his pragmatism made him a superb ruler in wartime. The ultra-militarized society he had created was entirely dependent on the Imperium being constantly at war. Even if the Great Crusade had proceeded exactly as the Emperor expected, it still would have run out of enemies eventually. And when you have a few trillion newly unemployed soldiers with no other skills beyond killing on your hands and no other purpose in life beyond said killing, well, they tend to get rowdy. He should have realized this already when he had to mop up the surviving thunder warriors. 
It remains unknown how the Imperium would have continued to look after the Great Crusade was completed and how the large military would be scaled down or if such a feature in cold even be possible with a civilization he designed to work only in the presence of a steady stream of conquests. Sure, some of the Primarchs and Legions had other skills like Gilliman's political organization, but the rank and file, or the likes of the World Eaters, there are hints that he might have planned to fix that by arranging the Primarchs to come to blows with each other, but we all know exactly how well that turned out which if anything makes him look even more foolish as a result. The Emperor's concern for humanity as a whole belied his refusal to acknowledge that humanity was not just a species, but also a group of individuals with infinite variety and whose goals did not necessarily support his own. The fact the fact that other human civilizations such as the Interrex had already found ways to fight against chaos on their own and were just as advanced as the Imperium if not more so meant nothing to him, or at least, to his plan. In his mind, he alone knew what was good for humanity and anything short of total submission to the Imperium was grounds for destruction even or especially if they were doing a better job than he was. In effect, all his efforts were performed in the name of an abstraction that arguably never existed in the first place. He made a critical mistake in that trying to erase religion without replacing it with secular ideals that had the same degree of universal appeal, lacking the immortality and inhumanly grand perspective of the emperor. It's a basic part of human nature to look for meaning and purpose in a cause greater than oneself. Especially in the harsh and grim dark universe that was the old knight, the imperial truth tried to do this. But it didn't take into account that reason, logic, and humanism were by definition too mundane to be suited for the replacement of the old religions, as they were poor substitutes for finding individual meaning. The fact that the imperial cult took off so quickly after the emperor's internment on the golden throne and is arguably the only thing keeping the imperium a remotely unified entity in the present, is proof that the emperor was once again either too stubborn for his own good or too divorced from the normal human condition to understand the value of belief. In either case, all it accomplished was giving all four of the ruinous powers a reason to get rid of him, while also giving them an invaluable tool to do so in the form of Lorga. And all while he was telling the Primarchs that demons were just another Xena's race in an ill-advised attempt to dispense with their mythological appearance and obvious possession of supernatural powers, this attempt left them vulnerable for chaotic corruption among themselves or their legions. Yes. He gave them incredibly vague warnings, but those were not even close to the amount of information he needed to give them. Or, for those of us who think this sounds just a little bit religious for our tastes and don't want to get into a philosophical debate over the importance of belief, imagine the trillions of citizens who had gone their whole lives worshipping a belief only to have Olymps turn up and just say no without a word of explanation. For a guy who says he's trying to avoid the same mistakes the Elder made, his obsession with human supremacy and the supposed purity of the human form is defined by what his own opinion are almost indistinguishable from the pre-fall elder's certainty that they were the rightful rulers of the galaxy. Even if humanity did become a purely psychic race, nothing would stop it from making another chaos god by accident. It's not a stretch to hypothesize that this was itself a ploy for him to use the collective psychic power of humanity to elevate himself to the status of godhood, where he could truly rule with infinite power. The only beings who knew how to create new parts of the webway were the old ones, and they're all dead. At best, the webway project would have delayed the inevitable before the fact that nobody can figure out how to keep it working became obvious. And since the warp already bleeds into the webway at the best of times, well, the whole thing would have been rendered pointless if or when the warp completely breaks through into the webway. The so-called mistakes and subsequent fall of the Elder may have been foreseen and apparently planned for. By the close of the 41st millennium, the psychic gestalt of the conscious dead Elder have formed the new god in it, quite probably proving that willpower eventually counters desire and completing the Elder's psychic ascension as a species. The Emperor may not have been aware of this and humanity's own cyclic awakening may not have been as tragic, but to give him credit, his own endgame is somewhat similar in wanting to nurture mankind's psychic ascension but without the catastrophe, he is possibly positioning himself to become the focus for humanity's willpower rather than needing enough souls to die before they gestalt together, becoming a guiding will rather than a collective one. Most damningly of all, his total disregard for the possibility that the Primarchs might actually have their own thoughts and feelings ended up being one of the the key reasons why so many of the legions ended up falling to chaos in the first place. The humiliation of Lorga was the ultimate catalyst for the Horus heresy, and is probably the most colossal failure the emperor has ever produced. 
This event is what showed the future heretics and us who the emperor truly is behind his charisma and lofty dreams. Logger was so enthralled with his father that he not only worshipped him as a god but made it his life's goal to convince others to do so as well. He built gleaming monuments and cities in his name. He trained an entire legion to glorify their perfect and benevolent father. That father knew of this, of Logger and his goals, and all seemed well for a hundred years. Suddenly, the Ultramarines descend and obliterate the greatest of Lorga's cities and the Emperor himself forces Lorga's entire legion to kneel before the invaders. The Emperor tells his most admiring son that he, alone of all his brothers, has failed. Reread this paragraph, then reread it again. This happened with no warning of any kind. Lorga had not been disobedient or rebellious. It would be as if God set Vatican City on fire, kicked the Pope over put out the fire by covering him in dog shit, and then told him to quit being such a fucking pussy. The main thing this incident says about Lorger is that he's such a tough motherfucker that he didn't break down completely forever or kill himself upon the revelation that the most powerful and perfect being he can even imagine hates him. Personally, the emperor took the leader of the most powerful religious organization in the galaxy and kicked him straight into the claws of evil gods powered by belief. Angren's case is self-explanatory. Honestly, if it weren't for Ems sending him into battle so often he would have rebelled sooner. Sure, he couldn't just let one of his primarchs get himself killed in a slave revolt, but you'd think he'd send down some of the warhounds or something instead of warping him away and earning Anglin's undying hatred. Instead he could have earned Anglin's undying love. Furious loyalty in the worst case. A martyr primarch who died from the nails and gotten rid of was one fucked up dusty planet's short term compliance worth the whole shit roller coaster. We will never know why a man superman primarch goddammit who knew only killing not even war. Just murdering people with murder nails jammed in his brain and is traumatized to eternally hate his lord should be controlling 100,000 space marines is something only the emperor and his divine ass can fathom. Fulgrim's road to damnation started because he decided to loot a slana she possessed sword, knowing nothing about chaos. Fulgrim had no idea he was using an incredibly dangerous warp artifact that that would lead to untold consequences. It didn't help that his strict xenophobic teachings prevented Fulgrim from taking Eldred's advice about the Lyre Blade into account. Even with the Webway fuck up which itself could have been prevented had the Emperor not kept it a secret from the most important people in his plans Magnus might have remained a loyalist if the Emperor had brought Magnus to the great work earlier, or had him stationed on terror along with Dawn or even just listened to his warning that Horus had turned traitor. Instead, he totally disregarded Magnus's entirely correct warning in favor of allowing Ras the one Primarch who most wanted Magnus dead to arrest him because he didn't like the way said warning was delivered. And with the door already broken, he could have simply siphoned Magnus to clear it all up instead of jumping to conclusions. Similarly to Angron, Mortarion always resented the Emperor for not letting him get to kill his adoptive father. And when the Emperor refused to give him an answer about the obvious piece of warped tech that was the golden throne he concluded that the emperor was a hypocrite and the imperial truth was bullshit. The emperor, being the wisest and most powerful human sicker in the galaxy of all people, should have been able to see that Conrad Kurz was an unstable sicker who was on the fast road to devolving into insanity due to his uncontrolled talents. And if he already was aware of it, then at best he was being incredibly careless. And what with the whole Night Lord's comprise of criminals? One must really question his divine quality control. Or maybe he is just totally rely on his large huge brain capacity to manage things, and simply dismiss things that can't fit in. Completely ignoring that Perturabo needlessly had 1 in 10 men in his legion killed by decimation under flimsy pretenses. Coupled with the fact that Perturabo was originally a peaceful, diplomatic soul, these two should have triggered some alarm bells about his mental stability. While it was said that the Emperor considers the Primarchs more of tools and less of his children, in retrospect it was obvious that there was plenty of favoritism going on. Seriously, why can't the biggie act like a spiritual psychiatrist for one fucking moment? Horus himself was only pushed to fall because the chaos gods played on his worries that he wasn't fit to be war master combined with the unrealized. Greater fear that the Emperor never cared for him as a person and that he, the other Primarchs, and the Astartes as a whole would have no place in the Imperium after the Great Crusade's conclusion. Horus likely being aware of what happened to the Thunder Warriors when they outlived their usefulness at the end of the Unification Wars probably stoked that particular fire nicely. You'd have thought the Emperor's most beloved son would at least have been shown the special rooms in the Imperial Palace the Emperor made specifically for the Primarchs to live in after the Great Crusade ended. 
or at least discussed what he had planned for them when they weren't needed as generals any longer. But no, perhaps the biggest kicker to this is that if we're going to take all of Black Library into account, the Emperor never truly cared for the Primarchs at all loyalist and traitor included, viewing them as nothing more than powerful but ultimately expendable tools to further the ambitions of humanity's survival and ascendancy, as determined by the Emperor, of course. Although one can always argue that the remaining Primarchs stayed loyal either because they believed in his vision for humanity or were too loyal to be turned. There's no telling exactly how long that might have gone on after the Great Crusade's end. Some of them showed signs of disloyalty to the Emperor even during the heresy. Only staying on his side either out of loyalty to mankind as a whole Gilliman and his Imperium Secundus come to mind here, by recognizing the other side as an even greater evil like Jagatai, or only because the Imperium is on the winning side if Kurz's trolling was true. The Lion, which probably isn't true considering he stabbed him in the next paragraph and told Kurz that he didn't care and that he was balls to the wall loyal. To clarify the above point, after Gilliman's meeting with the Emperor following the Primarch's revival, he noted that while he loved humanity as a whole, the Emperor was practically incapable of caring about individual people, even the Primarchs. Everything and everyone was just a tool to him. While some might interpret this as the Emperor simply being a dick, you have to understand his situation. He is an immortal superhuman with a plan to uplift humanity. The fact he's immortal means he would be unable to form any meaningful relationships with mortals, because he'll always outlast them in one way or another. His plan also involved tons of sacrifices for the greater good Balam heresy. Common good, when you're forced to sacrifice anything to continue your plans. You can't afford to be too attached to someone you might have to throw into the fire in a split second. The Emperor is cursed to always looking forward to the endless road of the future, so he can never live in nor understand the concept of the present. As a result, his plans failed to account for the fact others might not just meekly go along with his plans without question and became further detached from the real human condition. Overall, and quite ironically, the main reason why the Emperor's plan was doomed to fail in time was because while the Emperor understood the path on what humanity must take for a brighter future, he himself was either unable or unwilling to understand humanity. Instead, he chose to remain distant from them and act like he was above their understanding, and that they should just simply follow him because he's the emperor and he alone knows what's best for humanity, because shut up or be on the receiving end of a bolt gun. Even more ironically, this was how the majority of the gods that humanity originally believed in acted as well, and at least they had the excuse that they really were divine. For all his efforts to remove religion, the emperor played the part of a god hilariously well. Lastly, maybe the emperor understood that his primarchs were unstable and unreliable. Given the issues with the thunder warriors he had to know all of this was coming eventually just from past experience. But it's possible he just didn't expect it to be in the form of a team deathmatch. He could see Kurz being unstable enough eventually that he and his legion would need to be removed but expected it to be individual legions and primarchs that would need censure but couldn't foresee his own flaws causing enough gulfs with each of his primarchs that they would have a reason to band together. If that was the case. He was a poor father and a poor leader not to see his own arrogance as a flaw in his design. If it is true that he had always intended the Primarch's rivalries to grow to the point that they would begin fighting each other. All of the above is even more damning since it means he had made them flawed on purpose and yet failed to see how Chaos would gladly exploit said flaws at the first opportunity it got. On another note, the fact his ossified self has managed to shed tears and there was an incident where everyone across the Imperium saw statues of the Emperor weeping tears of blood due to the incoming disasters of the end times may mean that he has finally started to realize how horribly he fucked up on every possible level. Or maybe it's hurting even more than ever to stay sit at the golden throne. The latter is far more likely, according to Rob out Gilliman. When he met with the Emperor after his revival, he treated Gilliman as a mere tool without showing even the faintest display of affection or care for him as a person. One can only assume that 10,000 years on the golden throne has done absolutely nothing to make the Emperor be less of an asshole. In fact, He's described as being human in name alone, and Gilliman believes that even if he is a god he doesn't deserve to be worshipped. So he was a horribly flawed but still well-meaning OCD workaholic with the needs of the many. Outlook on life meaning he couldn't afford to show love or compassion to anything but mankind as a whole, not even his sons, and ultimately paid the price for his complete separation from the human condition. If you have experience and pedagogy, he is your typical working dad who can't spare time to raise sons and makes very bad fatigue influence decisions, and after they grow up, wonders why they grow to hate and be distant. Add the lack of a loving mother figure for the kids, and well, planning for the Horus heresy. 
to throw a spanner into the works when considering whatever the Emperor's goals might have been. A very interesting claim was made by Malkada himself to his dying confident Sebel Nyasta that the heresy was all part of the plan. That the Primarchs were designed as conquering tools and nothing more, set on course to fight for dominance and eventually turn on each other and challenge the Emperor directly. This is corroborated by what we already knew from Master of Mankind and the Emperor's own attitudes towards the Primarchs which admittedly has constantly been shown to be shifting. As has been frequently pointed out the final confrontation between Horus and the Emperor, as we currently know it, would not make any sense if he merely considered them to be disposable tools. Anyway, why hold back then to start out with? The Primarchs were manipulated against each other with unequal favor. Jealousy is stoked in order to achieve this, and he also claims that those who would not be manipulated never reach the end game. What is not certain is whether he was speaking the whole truth since he does later admit privately just after the conversation that he had to lie to mortals to spare their sorrow. So what parts he lied about are uncertain he could have made the whole just as planned story up. It could have all been true and he was regretting manipulating the Primarchs and their legions. It could even refer to a single sentence where he implies that the Emperor will save her soul after death. He also admits that the outcome had been altered by the great enemy who had emboldened their champions and started the battle early so he did not know with absolute certainty how it was going to turn out. However, as shown from the borders set to the novel The Outcast Dead, Malkada and the Emperor were certainly shown to have considerable amounts of foreknowledge regarding the Horus heresy and certainly did play the Primarchs against each other in order to attempt to counter the manipulations of chaos. However in the borders set, Malkada is shown that the Primarch's destinies were not necessarily fixed and could have been played in different ways. Some Primarchs were sacrificed for greater goals like you would remove a figure from the board to give you a better edge. Whilst the Emperor had the knowledge that certain others were crucial to final victory, Malkada is also shown to not have been aware of the full plan or the flow of destinies. He is unaware of how certain seeming winning strategies are left in play because they have unexpected knock-on effects, or that certain moves played early or late could have had disastrous consequences. Such as why the invincible Bastion is not used to take the Lord of Hearts early on in the war, since it would force both of the twin pieces to switch sides to the Warmaster and be able to move on the Emperor's home space and cause the game to be lost. This is also significant because it shows that whichever side the Primarch had joined could have been variable, and did not automatically mean that it was working towards the same goal as its leaders. Malkada was also surprised to find out that the game could be changed by factors they might be unaware of, such as the corruption of the Lord of Clouds in the mid-game when they had expected him to resist like he had in their previous playthroughs. The Emperor appeared genuinely saddened by this change hinting that he either still cared about them even when they had already turned against him, or that some Primarchs could have potentially been recovered and returned to the fold after the conflict had ended. Malkada was also shocked to think that the Emperor could be blindsided by such an alteration, with Malkada only beginning to see the game for what it truly might have been, rather than simply a means of testing strategy. It is important to note that from the beginning of the game, the Primarch pieces were essentially blank slates, and only gained their unique shapes and identities as part of their first activations after the scattering, possibly indicating that the Primarchs could have potentially switched roles with one another depending on the first few moves. Perhaps Sanguinius could have become the Lord of Hearts, or Percherabo become the Invincible Bastion. Before the first move takes place, the pieces were arranged 10 per side, which was more than available Primarchs at the time. The Emperor had his own golden piece but the Lord of Hearts began the game in blue and became switched in the first move giving the Warmaster 11 pieces after the first move while the twins would not be divided until the second move providing 21 pieces on the board. Ignoring the additional piece the fool that Malkata had never seen before, means that there must have been one other significant player somewhere that we are not aware about. That and the division of units under the control of the Emperor and Warmaster in the game would have been very different from the apparent division of loyalist traitor Primarchs in the actual conflict, meaning that the roles they played and were expected to play did change drastically as the game progressed. Taking several factors into account, it is absolutely certain that Malkada and the Emperor had enough foreknowledge to know that the Horus heresy was going to happen from the point of the scattering and would. To say that it was all part of the original plan would be a stretch. That many of the Primarchs had municipal gifts per Churabo's architectural mastery, Fulgrim's artistry etc or came with purposes suited to the Emperor's grand plan for a post-human society Magnus and the Webway. Mortarian as a witch seeker shows that the Emperor probably did have a plan for his Primarchs that didn't involve losing half of them and then chaining himself to the Golden Throne. Otherwise why make 20 Primarchs with gifts related to your post-battle plans in the first place if you knew you were going to lose half of them? 
In fact, the border set goes a long way in explaining why the emperor couldn't do any more with his advance notice of impending conflict. The emperor's foresight was not perfect and it did not necessarily marry up with his practical knowledge. Even though the game he played with Malkada showed the double-edged sword, the uncrowned monarch and the angel spending most of the game off to the side, the emperor had no idea what they were actually doing until Malkada relayed the message from Lemon Russ. His psychic foresight seems to have been shrouded in allegory and symbolism, rather than concrete certainty. Also note that destiny is different from what the Primarchs were designed for case in point Magnus being designed to operate the Golden Throne, but also being destined to damage it. While Emperor had designed all of his Primarchs for specific tasks, he would not have been able to identify the destined role that each Primarch was meant to play until events had already been set into motion and pulled them onto certain paths. He might be able to guess that Magnus was the library or that Dawn was the invincible bastion but could not have been certain until the first moves of the game had been made. So until then he could only treat the Primarchs according to their gifts, hailing them as heroes, building them statues and trying to steer them away from obvious sources of corruption such as sorcery or religion, potentially causing a similar conflict to happen albeit with a different combination of playing pieces on the board, or alternatively sacrificing any control he might have actually had over the Primarchs and still have ended up with a disaster on his hands. Also bearing in mind that he still needed to complete the Great Crusade and his Webway project. To put those plans on hold until the issue with Primarchs had sorted themselves out would probably have done him no good either because like the Emperor himself, Chaos is capable of playing the long game. Lorga is an interesting issue Malkada once claimed that if he could have saved just one of the traitor Primarchs, it should have been Lorga. However, from the borders set, the Emperor points out that game doesn't start with any piece other than the Chosen. Strongly hinted to represent Lorga with his initial swaying of Horus and thus beginning the heresy. This implies that no matter what moves are planned for, or what Primarchs ended up on either side, Chaos will always have a chosen piece to start the game with. If Horus had been protected, Lorga might have simply started the conflict with someone else, making chosen Lorga perhaps the more crucial piece. Though keep in mind that Malkada speaks with the benefit of hindsight, and as mentioned previously, the Emperor was not omniscient. It is possible that neither of them were to fully realize that Logo was the chosen until the first move of the game had already been made. What is most tragic is that Lorga really wanted the love and approval of his father and was probably the most fanatically loyal to him in the early days. So turning him into Chaos most pivotal piece is a cruel irony. If it were possible to have actually saved Logger before the conflict started, it would have probably unbalanced the game as Chaos would have been forced to find a different Primarch to fill the role of Chosen, potentially upending the game altogether. Until the end of the heresy, Malkada was not actually aware of how the final conflict actually played out, having seen himself only as an advisor. He was ignorant of his own role. The Emperor showed him in the final days that is peace, the fool would switch places with the Emperor to snatch victory and allow the uncrowned monarch to play his salvation strategy and win the game against chaos by tearing the throat out of the serpent. Malkada's lighter his servant was most likely to provide the illusion of control, when in fact the Emperor and Malkada were desperately seeking to find an alternate solution that would not doom everyone. But pretty much like the Emperor stated in the Outcast Dead sometimes the only victory possible is to keep your opponent from winning. But what does all that mean for the duel? Yeah, about that. Regarding the Emperor's duel with Horus, we're all reasonably sure we know the old story. The Emperor faces down Horus, and had the power to rather stomp him, but his love for his favorite son prevented him from going all out, and Emps gets his ass kicked. It takes an extraordinarily callous killing by Horus to finally convince the Emperor that Horus is completely beyond saving, and Emps blasts him full power to put an end to the Horus heresy. The rising problem here is that this version of events heavily relies on the Emperor's compassion particularly towards his sons. Compassion that the Horus heresy books and Dark Imperium assert that he never had, either then or in the 41st millennium. For example, the Emperor put down his Thunder Warriors as soon as they served their purpose, and he didn't even pretend to care about Anglin and his Butcher's Nails, asserting that he would keep him as long as he had a use for him, and so on. Anyway, without compassion, the duel scene in its current form simply does not work. After all Horus had done in the years before, in a room with the maimed corpse of Sanguinius, a loyal and beloved as far as it goes with Big E, at least son of his, there is really no way he would have gone all fatherly love on Horus and not just blasted him, or at least tried to. Maybe the current form is imperial propaganda trying to conceal the fact that Horus simply kicked his shiny golden ass for some reason? So what the hell actually happened? A very good question, at this point. Lori Golding has implied that when the heresy books finally get to it, the final duel may play out very differently from how we think we know it. 
It certainly wouldn't be the first time it's been retconned. One possible explanation for why imps couldn't immediately obliterate Horus is perhaps due to divided attention and strength. During the fight, Malkada was being taxed to the core and maybe the imps was lending his power to buy Malkada some more time and thus was not able to actually unleash his full strength on Horus. However, Malkada had already received the same speech about being used as a disposable pawn by the Emperor for the sake of the overall goal, and knew he was going to die anyway as the throne switcheroo had been planned before the traitors had even arrived at Terra, so the Emperor would have no reason to stall just to save one man, even if they were genuinely friends. The Emperor also knew in advance that the outcome would be his entombment on the throne. When he found out about this he claimed that it was more than he expected but went so far as to tell his custodians that his dream for the future of humanity was pretty much dead. Without the support of Magnus who was always intended to sit on the throne unless someone came around with the knowledge to fix the throne he would be trapped there until it had failed but according to his discussions with Malkada there was room for salvation to come later. One other possible suggestion for why the Emperor might have stalled is perhaps his prescience glimpsed some preferable alternative to simply pasting Horus then and there, but until that gets resolved it can only be speculation. On a rather related note, one can assume me money knew the tragic cases of Magnus, Kurzangran and all of his sons through premonitions. Given that the future can be changed as in the case of the lion who feared the future of Kurz though not necessarily changed for the better or come without consequences such as knowing that Rogel, Dawn could have defeated Horus early in the war. But Alpharius would have assaulted Terra and resulted in a chaos win anyway the only options available to E-Money were to salvage the best he could from a shit situation. Anyway, he is now stuck on the throne guiding his subjects in the few ways available to him in his current state as an all-powerful vegetable. Perhaps, or perhaps not, to have hesitated out of love for a son. The final weakness during the last test to save mankind. That would have shown why the Emperor couldn't afford to love anyone, not even his own sons, and turned him into what he is now. Though more recent fluff shows him to have always been more pragmatic than that. While he did seemingly care for his sons, his foresight had shown him that half of them would turn to chaos and move against him whether or not you believe Malkada's statement that it was planned from the start. Though even with this foreknowledge, the Emperor was on the back foot and many of the actions of the Horus heresy involved playing the Primarchs against each other to prevent an overall chaos victory rather than achieving an imperial win. ADB on the Emperor and Master of Mankind. Too long didn't read everyone whom has the chance to be in the Emperor's presence perceive something different, based on their own experiences and expectations. Nothing he ever says should be taken at face value, since it is warped by the narrator's interpretation. In response to criticisms on his portrayal of the Emperor, ADB posted this detailed answer. That's true, and I definitely wanted to bring out a better understanding of his vision and what he was up against. But that's also lore I'd wager anyone with a deep knowledge of the setting already had a handle on to some degree, whether explicitly or not. What I wanted to avoid was too much new stuff. You have to put in something new, and thankfully what little newness I do introduce in my work is seemingly well regarded. But I've always said our job as I see it is to illustrate the setting and show what it's like to live there, not to set it in stone. As much as the fandom adores advancing the storyline, it's not something that interests me. By and large, I try my best to show things from the perspective of characters on the ground level, bring a few perceptions of the setting through the lens of my own imagination and the insight I'm lucky enough to get endlessly talking about the setting with its creators and inheritors, and then get out. Most of my books are, to some extent, not definitive. They're about some guy, not the entire faction. Grim Aldous in Hell's Reach has no bond to the wider war on Armageddon and hates that he's been left behind by the Black Templars. But he's hopefully a good example of what it feels like to be a Black Templar, and to think like one, and, crucially, what it feels like to be a human around them. Talos and the other characters of First Claw spend a trilogy unable to decide what the Night Lord's Legion really was, and each of them remembers their glory days differently. I didn't want to speak for the whole Legion. Hyperion and the Emperor's gift is a largely generic Grey Knight present in dire circumstances. HH wise, I didn't want to show all of the word bearers and base a book around the expectations of Corfaron, Lorga, and Erebus. So I focused on the serrated sun in the middle of the changes taking place across the galaxy. Savage Weapons is largely about Kor Swain, not about Kurz and the Lion. The Master of Mankind is about Ra, Zephyr, Jaya, and Land in the heart of the Emperor's plans for the species, not about the Emperor himself. As much as I wrote about Angren and Lorga, they get significantly less in their head screen time than most other Primarchs in most other books. It's harder to do that with the heresy, but, again, I do my best to present individual experiences and mindsets in characters like Ken, Argyltal, 
and Ra, rather than definitive looks at the entire chapter legion faction and setting its events in stone. I try to present a feel for how it is to live inside that culture and be part of the experiences they go through. It's about immersion into the chapter or legion, presenting them as believable and real, not definitively saying all of chapter X are like Y. So, I'm reluctant to talk about TMO and the Emperor's perception in that book in any real detail. Partly because the book is still new and there's a lot individual readers would do better discovering for themselves without my thoughts in public. And partly because everything I'd say is ultimately in the book. Anything I say will be taken out of context or weaponized one way or another somewhere, and used in a way that makes me sigh, cringe, or a dramatic melange of both that shall hereafter be called the sigh cringe. Plus, most of all, I have faith in readers. They don't need me defining anything, even if it might be interesting for a few peeps. So, I'll just say this. The master of mankind is entirely from the perspectives of people that meet the emperor in pretty specific circumstances. There are, obviously, other circumstances to come. Nothing in it is definitive, even less so than my usual work. Any definitive statement you can make about how the emperor sees something or does something is almost always contradicted in the book itself. That's not an escape clause or an excuse, it's the point. Writing him definitively would have been the easiest and most disappointing thing in the world. And on that note, remember, everyone views 40k differently. What person X is absolutely certain is the truth of the Emperor and the best way to present him would be laughed off by persons A, B, and C. The flip side to that is that not every perspective is founded in fact or understanding. The earliest I've not read this yet, but, criticisms and misunderstandings of TMO are in, ah, certain Reddit Chan style locations was regarded by GWIP folks as, I quote, These angry people seem to be beholden to a version of 40k that has never existed, but in all seriousness, I don't want to delve too deeply into explaining the ways the Emperor's contradictions matter or don't matter. They're there, and they are definitely formative. Totally agree, if not exactly definitive. With the Emperor, a lot of interaction is about getting out what you put in. You get what you give. Your perceptions and expectations are reflected back on you because that's how the human brain perceives everything a fact that cannot be overstated. The science behind it is fascinating and all important, especially when you're talking about someone who exists on that plane of power. At one point the emperor makes mention of the notion that he's not even speaking, that being near to him allows the conveyance of meaning through psychic osmosis and communication telepathically. He's not even talking. It's raw understanding filtering through a mind. Or just the way the mortal mind comprehends the aura of what the emperor intends. Or, 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 that's what I mean. TMO is littered with that stuff. Does he only address the primarchs by number instead of name? Some characters will swear he does that. And doesn't that just perfectly match their perspectives of the primarchs as either emotionally compromised to human things that think their sons are? Or genetic masterworks that have become galaxy damning screw ups that have literally let the galaxy burn and brought the Imperium to its knees, leading people to be exiled from their home world's land. Do you think Sanguinius will agree? Or care that's what mortals think? The Emperor's portrayal on that isn't even consistent between Ra and Diocletian, two of his custodians, and on page 1. The only time he interacts with the Primarch himself, and the one and only thing he says to Magnus the Red is Magnus, like, that's a pretty strong indication that the interactions which follow are playing by different rules. Ra sees a warlord of humanity, just a man, but a great mean, weary and defiant, burdened by responsibility. Demons see their annihilation, and go insane in his presence. One of the knights, as they are marching through the throne room, is caught in religious rapture, unable to do anything but stare at the glorious halo of the emperor of mankind on the golden throne. One of the sisters of silence, in the same room, literally just sees a man in a chair. Another character, not imperial, asks her custodian if the emperor even breathes. She believes he's a weapon left out of its box from the dark age of technology, with thanks to Alan Bly for that one. He adores that theory. So I don't think it's exactly a spoiler to say that if and when I get to write a character like Sanguinius in the Emperor's presence, or Malkada, they'd have entirely different experiences than Ra and Lan. I'd love to have had that in TMO, but as much as it would have given wider context, these aren't rule books and essays. It would have been self-indulgent for the sake of hoping people get it, and cheapened the story being told, which was ultimately in a very narrow and confined set of circumstances. Breaking out of that narrative would be offering a sense of scope and freedom I was specifically trying to avoid in a claustrophobic siege story. Because theme and atmosphere is a thing.
so um some bad news for you guys um sony vegas kept crashing while i was making this so like what i've decided to do is i'm just going to cut the video here i'm going to make a part two i'll upload that for tomorrow it's just it really is it's it's just i don't know it's just shitting itself and i don't know what's going on so i'm just going to leave it here and um, we've still got a lot more to go over so don't worry like you know um as i say it'll be up tomorrow either way this is still an hour long video about the emperor of mankind so like you know it's not like it's a short one you know what i mean but uh no i love the emperor um i think to me eagle is the solid backbone of everything that is grim dark in the 40k universe and i think if you don't have a really good understanding of the emperor i don't think you really get a good understanding of the rest of the 40k universe because it all seems to link back to the emperor in some way like a lot of the overarching heavy lore in 40k is all it all comes back to the emperor what he's done or something about that you know what i mean i, I that's what i feel like anyway but like as always, I always say this, anytime I do a 1D4chan article, go over to 1D4chan right now and just check out some of their articles. I think it's the best work site on 40k there is. I think it's outstanding. It's really good. Um, I love the way it's written. <coughs> Honestly, I think it's really good. I really am. I wouldn't be making this video if I didn't really enjoy it, you know. Um, this is just to try and help spread some light on it. And I hope some of you guys do go over and check out 1d4 channel after this video so look um also to catch the second part um remember to subscribe and hit that notification bell and all that other good jazz but look go, go check out 1d4 channel if you haven't already just do it like you know just I'll, there's a link down below just just fucking do it would you oh fuck yeah this is the shit kill me now Ugh. two foot of pink one foot of stink baby two foot of pink one foot of stick. You can switch it around if you want, if you're a real man. Ah! Yeah!